everything that we lifted up. Does anyone remember any of the one or all three? Um, worship with all, all, did I'm saying that right? <laughs> worship with abandonment and worship with our life. Amen. Um, we talked about last week being a true worshiper. It just encompasses every part of us. It's not just a segregated part that we can, you know, I think sometimes we kind of compartmentalize ourselves. You know, we're a mother in this situation. We're a wife in this situation. We're a sister in this situation. And so when we talk about being a true worshiper, it encompasses our whole being. Um, and so that to me really stuck in what I take away from what we've been learned, what I've, I've learned through uh, looking at this a little bit different than I have in years gone by. Um, tonight, I'm, we're going to talk about still John 4.23, but the last part of a phrase where it says, uh, that the Father, not only is it the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What more, what that means and what that kind of looks like, I think is important for us to take a moment and look at that. And even on this week, as I was thinking and, and looking at that scripture more, was doing some, you know, some study how you go out and start pulling things together and kind of look and see what other people have said about this topic and what the word says about it. Uh, my eyes were drawn to Joshua 6, and then it dawned on me that on Sunday, while Pastor was talking about prayer, he kind of mentions um, the Jericho walls falling down uh, on Sunday in his sermon. And I thought how ironic that the Lord would lead me back to that passage to look at it a little bit different on tonight as it pertains to uh, spiritual and spiritual worship and in truth, being in spirit and in truth. And um, <clears throat> if I had to subtitle this week, it's going to be worship is a powerful spiritual exercise. Uh, worship is a verb and you participate. And, uh, it's an action word, so it does require action. <clears throat> it doesn't always require us to be, we talked about last week, it doesn't always require us to be uh, loud in the sanctuary or to, uh, there are moments where it, it, it requires us to be quiet and listening, but it's still an activity that we participate with. So I'm not going to read. If, when you get an opportunity, please take the time, look at Joshua, the sixth chapter. Um, as a child, that was one of my favorite stories. I thought, it was so phenomenal that you could just walk around the wall and then it would just fall down. That just, that just kind of left me in awe as a child, how God was able to do that. And then even when I got older, I was like, I wonder if he caused something up under the ground to start shifting. Cause I don't see where walking around the wall and, you know, clapping your hands and shouting would be enough to bring down the wall. <clears throat> and then as I got older, and began to really look at that and see what kind of wall I was talking about and that it was not just a wall, but it was two walls that fell. I was, I'm really in awe of how God can cause us to, if we be obedient and follow his word, how he can break down things that we think in our own strength and in our own sight uh, are insurmountable, okay? <clears throat> Let us read if we can. Somebody can get Joshua sick. Okay, what verses? You said in what version? Yeah, no, what verse? Verse. Uh, we're gonna look at. Uh, we're going to look at verses 20, now verses 15. Hold on, let me do it here. Let 
Let's look at verse um, 8. So I can start reading at verse 8. Okay, I have it. Start at verse 8. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horns started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priest with the horns and some behind the ark with the priest continually blowing the horns. Do not shout, do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout. Then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priest with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. All right, thank you. I was right there, we'll keep our finger there. So when I was looking at that, I said, wow, there is a part of, of worship that is, is, is very orderly. If you look the way he told them, if you do it this way, this is how they were prepared to march. Everybody was in their position and everybody played their role. So that helps us to see that worship, though it's a powerful exercise, that is a still a very orderly thing that, that God loves order and so it is still a very orderly thing and so I thought how could he get a whole you know we think about the children of Israel we got to think about those people that came um, through the wilderness and I understand even more now why everybody couldn't make this couldn't make it to this point because there were some people that were a part of that exodus out of Egypt that would not have walked around anything cohesively and organized six days and, and thought something miraculous was going to happen, you know? Um, so when we think about worship, we got to really investigate those things in ourselves. And I asked this question at the end last week, what is, what is the thing that keeps us from worshiping God freely? And when I say freely, I'm not talking about it being loud or, you know, uh, in front of others or anything like that. But what is, are there things that keep you from worshiping God freely? When we think about worship and being a true worshiper and being in truth and in spirit, is there something that keeps you from worshiping God freely? You're on mute, Sister Joy. Sister Joy, you're muted. You're muted. Hey, Joyce, we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> we see you talking. She's steadily talking. <laughs> can somebody help her out? Do we have a host that can help her out? Joyce, you're on mute, my dear. Wait a minute. Let me let me unmute her. And she told me to ask that you unmute, but I don't think she's she's looking. She is. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. 
Okay, see on my screen it said unmuted and I kept, I kept unmuting, but it wouldn't, mm -hmm. anyway. Anyway, what I was saying is I think that sometimes when I'm in the, in the presence of people who don't necessarily believe the same way I do, um, you know, I have a tendency not to always go at them about the way I do. And in a, in a sense, I don't request that they worship with me in a certain way. Um, sometimes it works, but other times when you know people, you try not to, uh, I don't want to say upset them, but you have to be able to understand them so that you can figure out different ways to, to approach. You know, sometimes we're in a setting and somebody will say something and then I'll, I want to say something really different. But, you know, knowing I can have, you know, um, kind of an explosive response sometimes, you know, I have to hold myself back because I don't want to put them in a space where, you know, maybe we've been friends, but now all of a sudden we're in a place where we're opposing each other. So it's kind of hard to to worship in that sense, at least for me. That makes sense. It really does. Because um, you don't want to be kind of, I, I can understand that what you said. And that's wisdom though, to know that and even to, and what compassion to even be considerate of the fact that you are, you don't want to be to say or do something that will make the atmosphere even more worse even than worse, what it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's important to understand also too, that there are going to be times when my worship is just going to look different from your worship. It's just mm -hmm. going to be different because we are different people, you yeah. know, and God moves in our hearts in an individual sense, sometimes in a unique sense, should I say. Yeah. And I think that that is something that we got to learn to embrace and to accept, especially when it comes to corporate expressions of worship yeah you know and it's not that you know we are not close I, I i love them like i'm supposed to um but i love them because they are them and um i i think in the long run because of who i've become i don't want to lambast them because they're not where they are i need to you know would have to go back and say god you got to give me you know, some way or some, you know, make the way for me to be able to approach in a way that I haven't approached before. That's good. That's good. Anybody else? Thank you for sharing that. Food for thought. You're welcome. <laughs> um, in the past, it has, it was shortcomings or feeling like I wasn't, um, worthy enough or doing the right things to step into that type of presence um and then I start pushing past that and having glorious experiences but sometimes it's still like if I do something wrong one day um I have to push past it um and just go ahead and step on into worship you know ask for my you know ask for repent and um step on into worship That's very good. Anybody, anybody else? Very good. Because you do have to, I believe you, you, you come to the Lord. Uh, you ask, you have to ask the Lord to, to clean you up when you're in his presence. I always think about Moses in that burning bush and how he, his face shined and glowed and all he caught was just the backside of the father. <laughs> Never looked upon his face, but just caught, caught him as he was passing by and how his, they said that he just had a glow about him for when he came down off of that mountain into chaos. But uh, I think about how, you know, just how all that is. And then getting into a place where uh, I can remember a long time ago where I was uh, in, been in the church since I was a very small girl, and, uh, but wasn't always doing Christian things, if you know what I mean. 
was living my life one way uh, outside of the church and then showing up on Sundays and uh, ushering for a piece of time and singing in the choir and doing everything, working, doing that. And one Sunday, um, I can remember sitting uh, in the congregation and got there in time to sing with the choir, but I just really felt like the Lord was like, you need to sit your tail down in that seat. Don't you get up and do nothing before my people today because I am tired of you raising your bloodstained hands up and worship to me and expect me to, to move on your behalf like that. So that was a hard thing for me. You know, I began to look at things that quite a bit different after that uh, to the point where, you know, he really was trying to get me in a place where I was living totally for him and not what I thought my parents ex were looking for, or what I felt like the pastor was expecting and, you know, ain't, ain't who and there and different things, just trying to make it through. And, and so the Lord had to really deal with me on, on some things. It was even to the point during that season, because it was a season of time I quit taking communion because I was like, I, I can't take it like this because my heart, I need to really deal with some things in my heart. My heart ain't right. And, you know, we read in the scripture where it talks about some people take communion and become sick and even sleep, which, they mean, which means they die because they don't go to the Lord's table correct. And, and unless you really take that general confession, which I love so much in our church, and really take it to heart and do the things that it says to do, I... I just took a period of time where I didn't even take communion for a while because literally I'd be sitting in church and this is my confession before you, I'd sit in church and I would close my eyes to pray and have flashbacks of sinful things I had done in the past would come up and I'd be like, whoa, where'd that come from? <clears throat> and then I had to really take a time where I really, you know, just close my eyes and allow God and I don't know that God was necessarily bringing those things back or if it was the enemy trying to keep me from being in a place where God could meet me. But what I did was I took those times where I was like, when that flash would come, I'd be like, God, forgive me because when that was going on, I shouldn't have did this, that, or the other. Will you clean me up, Lord? Allow me to make that relationship right if I did something wrong, you know? And I had to go through that as a process to get to a place where I could feel comfortable enough in my own skin to worship the Lord in, in, in spirit and in truth because I had to get purge out of that junk out of the way if you will. Um, <clears throat> what I, when I looked at this, uh, the destruction of Jericho, this was straight and obedience and, and you know, will you, will you do what I say do? Will you follow the man of God that I have sent a word through. Will you do it just exact, though it don't make sense. Because when we look at the construction of those walls around Jericho, there were two walls that were, the city was impenetrable. You know, they had built a, a safety net around there where nobody could get in unless they were allowed in. And so what he was telling them is that these walls are going to fall. And, you know, that for people to, to be looking up at these big tall walls where they said chariots could ride around the walls, we're talking about some big walls, okay? And they're not just one wall, but there were two walls. So it's like, oh my goodness, what kind of, what are you saying? Us walking around and you playing the, you got them carrying the Ark of the Covenant and you got the people in front and the rear guard in the back and they blowing trumpets and we walking around. And, and I could imagine the soldiers up on the walls looking down, going, look at them little people and what they doing. What do they think that's going to do? You know? And I know that sometimes God calls us to do things that don't make sense to us. We're like, oh, this don't make no sense. And this was one of those situations where this didn't make no sense. You just to walk around the wall, but okay. You know, you, that's when you have to remind yourself in the past of the things that God has done for you in the past, strictly because 
you did it the way he told you to do it. And Can not, I get a witness? And not on hey, <laughs> and not only to walk around that wall six times, but don't say nothing. Oh my goodness. Right. Girl, right. don't open your mouth, don't shout until he say shout. Oh right. my, I think I would have been highly challenged <laughs> trying to keep my mouth shut and walking around there waiting on something to happen. But you know what? Thank God for the mountains, but honey, thank him really, truly for the valleys. Yeah. Because that, you know, it, it used to be a time where I'd kind of, you know, I'd kind of look around and if folks wasn't, you know, if, if they wasn't praising, you know, I mean, if they, depending on who was doing up now, hey, I have a very good friend that he worships everything. I mean, he don't believe in no one guy. I mean, just whatever. We have constant conversations. But every chance I get, I'm always telling him about how good God is and that, hey, I'm not trying to defend him. I ain't trying to debate with him. I just know for myself what God <laughs> has done for me. And I know it was a God. And I know it was, you know, it wasn't no, it wasn't my efforts, it wasn't nobody's efforts. And I think that's the good part. The good part is that sometimes God does things that, I mean, that you know without a shadow of a doubt, it was God who did it. Because all your efforts, whatever you were trying to do, it looked bleak. I mean, you were like, hey, you had given up, but then God steps in. You're talking about providing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. he is a provider and, I, and without a shadow of a doubt, you, there are situations that under no circumstances were these things to happen. You know God intervened and made them happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think this is a huge statement of that too, you know. Uh, so I always, when I looked at this text today, I was really, you know, looking at it off and on throughout the day. Uh, of course, on my breaks and lunches. My two breaks and my lunch. I'm looking at it. Um, and uh, <laughs> girl, don't you get and, mad up in there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I was just really studying. And when we get to that fifteenth verse, uh, if I can get somebody to read fifteen, through twenty, the fifteenth through nineteen, fifteen through nineteen. Of Joshua, the sixth chapter, we're still there. Come on, people. Bible study. I know y'all got y'all's Bibles, but you. Let Let's me say, what, say, did you say the fifth? 15 through 19. Joshua 6, 15 through 19. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed. As an offering to the Lord, only Rahab the prostitute and the others in the house will be spared for, for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed. And you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. Now, in that little passage right there, again, we see the obedience again taking place in that 15th verse. And I love how he just paused to just bring a word. It's so important. That even as we go into, even as we worship, we got to really reflect on a word from the Lord. You know, we got to have a word from God to hold on to as we go through that. Other than that, we're doing empty worship. You know, um, he went and told them exactly what they needed to know. 
And the part that I love the most about that 17th verse is that God showed himself to be a promise keeper. He showed himself to be a promise keeper. He told uh, through the messengers that had spied out the camp before, they told Rahab exactly what to do. And in another passage or another text of scripture, it'll say, it'll show you, you just tie a red ribbon in the window. And she did everything that they, that she was supposed to do in that moment. And he said, as he, did, as she didn't turn those two messengers over to the people that were seeking to kill them, said that if you don't, if you do this, he said, my father will remember you. And when they came back to this time, they did not withhold from their keeping. They honored that, their promise. And so you look at this, first off, we're taking, God is giving, they're in the Canaan, they're going to destroy Jericho, burn it down, take anything that's accursed and burn it, keep only that that is consecrated from the Lord. It's God, his, God will take the least thing, the least person, the least item, and use it for his glory. Who would know that through Rahab, Jesus will come? If she's in his lineage. If you, you go over into Matthew and you begin to read the lineage of Jesus, Rahab's name is mentioned. And who would have thought she was a harlot? And we begin to think sometimes when we come to worship, I, who am I in my past? If I think about who I am and what I've done and, and what other people have labeled me as and done this, I could never stand and worship. But God honors our obedience. He honors our willingness to follow what he says. So, you know, I said they got ready and they did a marathon on their seventh day. So that's, it's enough we don't walked around the whole city one day every day. So it's enough to have people kind of looking at you like you're crazy that one time every day. But now, Lord, you want me to walk around seven times today? So people can really look at me like I have lost my mind. We being quiet and it's just this loud music that blast of the horn and the guards behind us. But we continue to do it and we're going to do it seven times. And then at the end, now, and here comes the part where Sister Smith will be happy to be a part of with a loud shout. When I tell you to shout, I want you to really go on and give it all you have. And I think it's important sometimes even, you know, I hear worship leaders sometimes doing that. And we're going to count to three. And on the, on the, at the sound, on the count of three, I want everybody to yell as loud as they can. Some people will be kind of put off by that in the church as if that was, you know, that's just a mockery of what's going on. Why what does it take out of that? And for some, it doesn't. But if you have Jericho walls in your life, I decree and declare that after you have done all that God has told you to do, you're going to have a shout to release in that, in that situation. And the one thing I liked about it, it, it was that God had already given the city unto them. They had to go through the process. Anybody else see that? They had to go through the process. He had already given the city. What does it say in uh, verses, in verse 16, at the end of verse 16, it says, shout uh, for the Lord has given you the city. Not that the Lord is going to give you or, or the Lord will give you, but he's already giving you the city. And so sometimes it's our obedience that allow us to see the fulfillment of what God is wanting to do in our lives. And it's our worship, our exercise of worship is what causes things to shake and to tremble and to, and to go. And a good thing for us to understand also, see, sometimes we can learn from our, our ancestors here, um, there were times that they took things that were defiled and generations paid for that. If we would just do it God's way and only hold on to those things that he tells us we have a right to hold on to, how much more will the Lord do for us? You know, how much more will God continue to have us to even, sometimes not even not even the monetary or the physical thing that he does for us, but for us to even come into a, a realization that we can stand in awe of him and, and, and just lift up a worship and a worthy praise. Amen. Um, so I think that's an awesome thing as well. I could go on this again. I encourage you when you get an opportunity, read uh, Joshua, the sixth chapter, read it all together. It's a, 
it's a smooth selling and it's so in, insightful i think just read through it and you know ask god to show you those little treasures and little nuggets along the way that he he made available and uh, no longer allow your past to keep you from giving god your all because that's what it's that's why it's called past is behind you you've already come through it so no, no longer allow your past to dictate you and to hinder you in your worship because you are worthy of god relishes and delights in your worship when you come to him in spirit and in truth and that truth is being honest with yourself being honest before god one thing i like about worship is worship is an intimate experience between you and the father is completely vertical it's a vertical experience it's between you and the father it's not necessarily horizontal kind of like what sister joyce was saying i can be around them and i can worship the god the way i want to worship them and i can't i can't push off onto them they're my way onto them trying to drag them over this way even sister smith alluded to that word friend I'm not going to debate with what you believe when it comes to my worship. I'm just going to worship the Lord the way I know he is directing me to worship. Him. You know, uh, <clears throat> and, and we talked about that. And even in this, I thought about when I was reading through this, I said, there goes Sister Shannon when she said that silence. He said, I don't want you to say nothing when you're walking around this wall. Nothing, be quiet. I don't want you to say a word. And I think that that's important too, because is sometimes in our silence, in our quiet places, when we really hear from God the most, you know, when the noise has stopped. You know, we got to just get to a place where we can, you know, quiet and settle ourselves and be able to really enter into this thing. And especially if we're going to have it to be a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. Any comments so far? Um, I think I caught like two comments. Like the first comment is, it's like um, I saw this video on Facebook where it was, uh, it's like a, it's like a Christian comedian, but like it had so much, it was funny, but it had so much insight to it. It was just like he's when God said when his one of his um, friends was an atheist, and he was like, "Can you pray for me?" He said, "Oh no, it's you atheist. What you need? What you need me to pray for you for?" But the atheist yeah. God said, "If you could, if I, if I see God move in your life, maybe you could do the same for me." And it's just like, mm -hmm. they kind of spoke to me because it's like, um, even though like people, you know, even especially in these days and times that, you know, agnostic, you know, being agnostic, you know, people going back and forth, just, just, just to understand like, is God real or, you know, have so many different questions, but like, understanding like us as Christians, you know, they might not be able to see, you know, God for themselves, but they see God working through your life. And it's just like, that kind of like kind of plants, you know, a little seed said, well, if, if God could do it for them, he surely, certainly could do for me. And I think that that wall of Jericho, so to speak, is the unbelief. Like a lot of people, you know, I mean, maybe some people are not, you know, you just see in the church body still have care of their own belief. Like you could be in church for so many years, but like we see that, you know, you know, I've been in church all my life, I'm saved, but like it's really just absolutely like seeing, we've seen them believing. I think it's like one of those walls of Jericho that so we have to like just continue to cast down because sometimes we could be in church our whole entire life have, you know, belief in God, you know, Jesus died, cross, rose the third day, he come back again. But sometimes in the midst of our world and, our, and our, what's going on in the world, sometimes those walls of unbelief just like rise back up, they rise back up. Yeah. And it's just like, but, but, and oftentimes like, um, uh, Miss uh, Cynthia Smith said that, you know, you got to praise God. Remember, that's like, to me, that's like, when you praise God in the valley, it, it, it should remember, like, you know, God brought me to do this. So how dare, you know, what's what's going on? I can see with my own eyes. You know, how dare I question God if he's still there? Because he's done it before. He's just going to do it again. Because, you know, the Bible says God is the same as he was yesterday. And just because something happened in our world today doesn't mean that he never did what he did yesterday. He's going to do it again. So that's why that's why I get that's why I get a takeaway from that's what I have to say. I mean, that's good. Don't worry. Shoot, 
the Bible study on you, Brother Sam. Know <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> you know what my month is, and you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, like, get ready for get ready for your month. As soon as I get the like, brother, you said what? Come on, come on, come on. I'm like this. I'm like, you busy the next two Wednesdays? Maybe. <laughs> uh, what's the, I did want to just say, you know, Tice is always talking about I'm coming up with all these quotes, but they just seem to always be appropriate. And this one says, remember, you can't reach what's in front of you until you let go of what's behind you. That's so true. That's so true. Sometimes I think we're our own worst enemy as it comes to being a, being a worshiper and, and worshiping with our whole lives. We can be our own worst enemy. It's sometimes it's our voice that keeps us from doing all and being all for God. It's not, we sit and we think about, you know, I can't do that because I used to do this and I used to do that and I, and sometimes now, if you catch me on the wrong day, I might do this, you know, and we kind of hold our own self back. But know that God is such a gracious God. If he wakes you up every morning, guess what? You're walking in his grace and he's giving you another chance. And, you know, as long as you keep getting up, you just got opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And I was thinking about the word when I decided spiritual exercise, I was like, because that's what we're doing as Christians. We are exercising. We're exercising our faith. Um, in Hebrews 11.30 is the one where it says, our faith links, links our weakness to God's greatness. That is, ain't that something? Your faith will, will link your weaknesses to God's greatness. All you have to do is believe. God, I have just a little bit of belief. They said just a little mustard seed, the grain of a mustard seed. Not even the whole mustard seed, just the grain of the mustard seed. So I've got that much faith, God. I can hold on to that much. Okay? I don't know how you're going to do it. You know, it's when you get to the point where you say, I don't care how you do it. That's how you know your faith is growing. You know, like, I, I need you to do this. I don't even care how you do it, God. I'm just trusting you to do it. And, and you just say, he's going to take care of it. And God is so faithful that he will if we sometimes get out of the way. Um, another great example of obedience and, and how God will shift to turn a situation around that just looked bleak. We look at Paul and Silas when they were in prison in Acts the 16th chapter, verses 24 through 26. It's, it, that is a huge testimony. And they said that that whole thing when it says and at midnight, things begin to shake and, and, and tremble and, and shackles begin to fall off. And, and, and what were they doing? What were they in the midst of doing when the, when the foundation started trembling and shaking and shackles fell off? What were they doing? You need to read it. Were they praying? Praying. They were, they were praising and worshiping. They were singing songs. Let's look at it really quickly. Acts 16. Acts uh, 16, what verse? 20, 24 through 26. I can read it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm reading from the NIV version. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, fastened their feet into the uh, shacks. About midnight, <clears throat> Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, all, I mean, at once and all, the prison doors flew open, and everyone chains went loose, became loose. Now, what, what kind of God we serve? Now, it's me and my homeboy in prison. We the only two that are singing and praying and singing hymns to God. But when God does it for us, he does it for the people that are around us. He said all of the prison doors open, all of the shackles. He did it for everybody. And 
that's how sometimes it may just be you that is really being open to the Lord and being used. And, you know, maybe you're singing, you're praying, whatever it is you're doing, because I believe that praise and worship so quickly interweave into each other. It's really hard for us to individually divine each individual activity. Uh, so I just believe that if we would just submit ourselves to him, that God is able to do it bigger than we could even think. You may be sitting at a point in your life where you're really trying to pray and see God and, and, and just being free in that moment with him. You know, sometimes I, I know myself when I'm praying, sometimes a song will come up in my spirit, a hymn or something will come up and I might just pause from speaking words to just kind of hum in the melody or, you know, uh, my daughter accuses me of doing the hymnal remix because sometimes it's not really what the hymnal said the words to the hymn was, but it sounded real good at that moment. So I'll just kind of do the remix to the hymn and, and kind of just be praying and, and just holding on and have two or three songs all merged together. They don't even be from the same hymn, but just kind of going in to that place with him is, you know, uh, Raquel was saying it's a glorious place when you get there. And I'll be like doing all of that. I won't even know why I'm in that zone. And then inevitably around me and my people start to call and say, girl, let me tell you what God did for me. Really? Because I was praying for you last night, but I didn't know you were even in need of that. Or I didn't know. And you begin to hear different things. And I think that we have to really, when we are being worshipers and we're doing it as a lifestyle and not just as a solitary individual um, thing, that we just do on Sunday between this hour and that hour when we're willing and we're open and we're available to do it whenever he purposes for us to do it. I believe that we can hold the enemy back from harming or hurting somebody we don't even know. You know, I just think we got to be to the place where we're open to be used and available to be used. And then Psalm 150 is always a good one for us to look at where it talks about heartfelt praise before God's people. It, it just tells you so many things. There's so many different colors and layers to worship and different things like that. Um, that it's just been such a, you know, it can, worship can be such a rich and rewarding experience if we would just uh, avail ourselves to it. Does anybody at this time, as I've been talking, have a testimony about how how God delivered you in worship and or maybe used you in that moment to be a vessel for somebody else's deliverance maybe that's good we don't get there by the end of this study don't think about those things those times where you were obedient and and a, and a, and a whole set of people Got the got the part the praise and everything. Um, I was looking for. I always think, you know, I really want to take um, Greek and Hebrew. I know it's. I would really love to to take some time and really just sit and, and, and take those courses and. Uh, I don't want to be graded on it or nothing like that. I just want to take the course. Can I just audit the course? I don't know. I don't want to get no grade on it. <laughs> I just want to do it. But there are seven, uh, there are seven ways to express worship in. So I just thought they were interesting and I wanted to share them with you as we get ready to wrap up on tonight. But the first one, we might not share all of them tonight, but I'm going to share a few of them with you. But the first one is Barack. And there was a song that, what is that guy's name? That's the name he sang with. Barack, hallelujah. Yes, who is he? The Bach. <laughs> yeah, who is he? Kevin, who is that man? Anyway, he sang this song years ago, and, and I was like, oh, I wonder, I'm not sure what he's saying, so I had to really kind of <laughs> look those things up with Barack, and when you, when somebody talks about Barack, it means to kneel and to bless God, to bow down. So, you know, that lets, that leads you to know that it's an actual physical expression of worship. Okay, halal is to be clear, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate, 
to be foolish, okay? And uh, he talks about David when he kind of explains that. It says that Halal could be, appears in the Old Testament 110 times where people just lost their minds for the Lord. They said David danced out of his clothes before the Lord. And then Shabbat is to shout loudly to command. To Lyle, to sing praises, singing out of the spirits, out of the spirit spontaneously. And when you think about those activities and being available, making yourself available to be used in that way, to just be free in the Lord in moments, and, and there's no set time that I think you can worship the Lord in 30 seconds if it, if you needed to in 30 seconds and be like, okay, I can go face this thing now. Um, I know this morning I just slept just to share my testimony about how my day has been going. I slept past my alarm clock. I haven't done that in a long time where I just didn't even hear the alarm clock go off. Uh, all of a sudden I'm sleeping or whatever and, and I felt like somebody shook me and I woke up and I looked at the clock. I was like, oh man, I would be really late for work today. So I had some, one thing I had to do before work and I was going to tell, I was telling myself, well, you can do it when you get off work. And I was like, no, you can't because you got to do Bible study. You know, you're not going to get away from down there to after seven and you got to get on the bus with the crazy people and then you go home. So you got to do it now. So I ended up, my journey started out in a lift this morning. Lifted to where I needed to drop off a payment. From there, uh, I walked from 41st to Purcell up to 39th and Purcell. And uh, for those that are physically fit and not overweight, <laughs> that don't sound like nothing, but you know, kind of walking gradually uphill uh, was a little bit interesting, especially with the mask on your face. So I get to the bus stop and I'm thinking, it's a place up here I could sit down. I get to the bus stop, some car that knocked over the bus shelter and the bench is gone. So I still can't sit down. So I sit there, I'm standing there, I'm looking, I'm like, okay, come on bus, could get on. So the bus shows up, I get on the bus. We have to load the bus from the back. So I'm looking at the bus driver, the back door is not open. So I'm like, she gonna let me in? I don't think the bus is full, what's going on? So finally she opens up the front door, I get in. I go sit in. I said, thank you. She grunts. I'm thinking, girl, don't grunt at me. I am late for work. I'm fat. I'm tired. I'm, I'm getting ready to perspire. Don't try me. So I'm like, uh-uh, just sit down, Lisa. So I get up to th take the bus to 39th and Trist. I get off of that bus. I'm going to connect on my Trist bus and come on downtown. So I get there. So I'm standing kind of close because I know the thing now with the COVID movement. If the bus is full, it's just going to pass you by. So you got to get up there pretty soon. So I said, Lord, please let there be a spot on this bus. Sure enough, that first bus came. It was full. It was not a spot. People were like, push me out the way to get to the bus. So I was like, mm, I just ain't going to say nothing, Lord, but you know, this can't be my day. This can't be my day. So I get on the bus, the second bus coming, which was right behind it. Get on the second bus, come on, go downtown. The rest of the ride is pretty cool. So then I get in. So I'm just flustered. So I'm like, I might go down and get me something to eat. I'm already late. Have you ever had that attitude? I'm already late. I might as well go down and just do what I'm going to do. And so I get that and everything come on in. Come to the desk and I sat down, open up my first email. Now I'm reading the first email of the day with all of my activity as a part of the energy as I'm reading this email. And I go, I, I know they ain't said that to me like that in this email. And it was like, all of a sudden, a hush just came over me. And I just sat here. And I said, Lord, I repent. It ain't nobody's fault that I woke up late but mine. Who I'm mad at, I ought to be grateful that the sleep wasn't eternal and that I did wake up. So God, I thank you that you woke me up. Let me, let me reset my day. I had to just literally just stop and reset the day. I put the email down. I said, let me just reset the day. When I got through praying, 
not just for myself and repenting and, and doing what I did to reset my day sitting at the desk. I looked back up and read that same email and it didn't even have all of that energy in it. It was just a real simple question. And I just wonder how many times sometimes we have fractured and torn up relationships because we go approach a thing with our energy not being right because my whole routine was out of sync this morning. I didn't get an opportunity to sit on the side of the bed when I first woke up and say, Lord, thank you for waking me up. Be with me as I go through my day, God. I didn't get an opportunity while I was in the bathroom of listening to a song that I normally listen to. My whole morning routine was completely different this morning. And I just think that we got to grab those moments and seize those moments where we can reset ourselves and really be what God has purposed for us to be and, and be willing to do that. I think this time, you know, of fasting that, the, that, that, you know, we're doing as a corporate body is a time for us to reset ourselves and to be, uh, to exercise and to stretch ourselves even more in our time of worship and our time of study in our time of praise and, and, and being, not being so hard on ourselves and definitely not being so hard on everybody else. Amen. And any comments, any questions? Phones. I hope I'm helping somebody along the way. I know I'm helping myself though. So, uh, Hopefully You're still helping me. I was looking. For, I was sure. looking for. A, um, I was looking around my desk for a sticky note to place on my computer. Stop approaching with the wrong energy because the wrong energy. Them, e stay them emails be seeming like they coming for you. I be having to reread and then do like a few times of reread, and you'd be like, "Oh, maybe they wasn't tripping for me." <laughs> right. Right. Maybe it was me. And I think right. you got to do that. It's like reading a text message. Sometimes you get a text message and be like, what? Who, who are you talking to? Another person is doing, oh, I sent that to the wrong person. And you done got an attitude just that fast. And when you feel, you know, we got to be careful. We got to really guard, uh, guard that stuff. And, and, and I, I wasn't even going to do this part for, for, for this Bible study, but Next week, we are going to talk about guarding your heart and, guard and protecting your energy. It is real important. And I'm not trying to be all esoteric or anything like that, but we got to really know that we are in a world where it is not flesh and blood all the time that we're going up against. Because, you know, if it was flesh and blood, we could just get throw them hands and get in there and do what we could do, you know, uh, or run, if that's what you used to do when, when it came to throwing hands. If you ran, you can run. And, if not, you know, kind of equalize things out now because I always tell people I'm too old to fight like I used to fight when I was younger. But now I have to just walk away or try to talk my way out of something. But just to be, you know, uh, we got to just really protect our energy and how we let, let things affect us that are in the atmosphere, you know, being around a negative person. And then all of a sudden you find yourself being negative or you be around somebody talk to a friend you ain't talked to in a long time and it's that friend that's that got that cussing spirit on them and before you know it if you don't watch yourself you'll be cussing back with them on the phone you know and those kind of things you know so maybe I don't have that problem you know God is still God is still saving my tongue he's still saving my tongue and uh but wherever you are you know I think it's important for us to be careful to protect our energy to guard our heart Everybody shouldn't have access to the very soul of us. Uh, and I think that's important to do that. Any questions that I can bring you answers back next week? Or we got Reverend Shannon on the hand on the line. I'm sure she got some answers for us. I'm I'm listening. I'm in my silent period. <laughs> <laughs> uh -uh, we done went through the seven days. We done shout it so now. <laughs> I don't have a question. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, okay. This this kind of helped me uh, this past four or five days have really been difficult. And I can relate to you about waking up late. And yeah. And um, 
it happened to me Friday. Friday was the worst day I've had since. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go into details, but it was not a good day for me. It was a good day because, yeah, I'm alive and fit. But spiritually and emotionally, it was not a good day. But I'm, I praise God for the time that I had between Friday and today yeah. <clears throat> that God would allow me to really just, like Shannon said, be silent and, and listen and, and read. And it, it just really helped me so much that today was a, a little better. It was a little better. Um, but, you know, I, I have to remember what you said about that energy. You might need to text me that so I can put that somewhere on. <laughs> I sure will. Because I'm because telling you. Had to, when you had have to. that negative energy and Ooh. you take it with you into the workplace, you know, it, it just kind of messes your whole day up. And I, I thank God for his, uh, I, think, I, think, I thank the Holy Spirit for really just, helping me me just I got up late again this morning because I'm not sleeping that well and you know the spirit was just speaking to me he, you know just say you know be steady just just be steady do what you gotta do and by me listening it helped me through the whole day so I wow. appreciate what you what you said this evening I, I do I really do uh well, we're at the hour right here at the last minute or so. I know uh, many of you weren't able to make it on at prayer time, but um, we will close out in prayer on tonight. And I pray that you all have a wonderful and blessed week. And uh, just, you know, if you're in a spot where your energy is not quite right, then we're going to have to be silent until it's time for us to 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 be seen again or heard again so be willing to know and understand you know to be compassionate enough to not want to make somebody else's day bad i think that's what i'm really talking about growing up here so let us pray god we just thank you we thank you for every family that is represented on this class on this zoom call but we thank you for everybody that's in earshot listening, God. Maybe they didn't have the phone out where you could be seen or anything like that, but they dialed in. And so, God, we thank you that they just took the time, God, to press in and to make themselves available for this. Lord, allow the word that has come forth on tonight in, in our Bible study to rest and to sit in the hearts of those people that are on this line uh, and allow it to allow our church to grow from the inside and out. Lord, we just want to be true worshipers and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we want to make sure, God, that we don't bring our sloppy seconds before you and expect you to bless them, Lord. But we want to come and give you our bless, our best, Lord. Uh, so God, give us a clean heart. Renew our mind, God. Continue to strengthen us in our faith, God, as we go day by day. And so, God, we just ask that you would just be with us. And then, Lord, I heard my sister cry out saying that she needed some help through this time. Lord, you know what Cynthia has been through. Lord, you know what her life has been. You know her past. And you know the, the, the tragedies that have happened to her in times gone by. So, God, I take this time just to lift her up in prayer, God. And, and I ask, God, that you would just protect her, Lord, uh, months ago. She prayed a prayer about bubble wrap. So God, I ask right now that you would just bubble wrap her up, Lord, and protect her, God, and protect her environment, God. And even on tonight, God, as she goes to lay down in her home, in her apartment, God, I just ask that you would just send a sweet peace that she would be able to get a sleep and a rest like she never has uh, had in a long time, God, that she'll wake up in the morning replenished and revived and ready to go out, God, and to do the things that you have placed in our hands to do, God. So be with her, Lord, and continue to minister to her through this time of grieving that she's going through, God. Uh, you know her pain and you know her suffering. So God, we ask, God, that you would just allow her that moment and that space in you to be comforted, God, as only you can give her comfort. Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Everybody have a good night. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you.